Hi everyone, uh, welcome on behalf of the Covinas uh, Multiple Cell WWF and Delta uh, at this session on climate change adaptation through nature based solutions for infrastructure. My name is Ham Duel, I'm the head of the Water Resources Department of uh, Delta uh, Happy to see you here. Um, I will briefly introduce uh, the session. Um, we will start with a keynote from Jeff Opperman from WWF. And after that, we will have a panel discussion moderated by Life Berger Lilhammer, uh, Principal Advisor on Water Resources Management from Milt Kozilt. And you as an audience can also contribute to this discussion by posing questions to the petable chat. If you have a question for a specific panel member, please mention that as well. Um, Eloy Dunamur from Multiple Silt will bring a selection of questions to the panel. Uh, we won't be able to answer all the questions during the uh, panel discussions, but you are invited to approach us after the session for further discussions. And we will let you know how to touch base at the end of the session. After the closure, we have a couple of take home messages. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Jeff Opperman. He is the global lead freshwater scientist at WWF, working on the intersection of science and conservation, especially in the fields of aquatic ecology, ecological flows, floodplain restoration, water resources management, and sustainable hydropower. Jeff, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. I'll just take one moment, share my screen and begin with the presentation. <clears throat> great, well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, and great to be part of this group and exciting discussion. And the topic that we're covering today, uh, climate change adaptation through nature-based solutions for infrastructure is very close to the, the theme of, of this Stockholm Water, Water Week on building resilience faster. So. Before we get started, let's let's make sure we're clear on what we're talking about. Um, so a good definition of nature-based solutions, uh, which is receiving lots of attention now. There's reports seemingly every day coming out about nature-based solutions. Um, IUCN offered a definition in 2016 that is, I, I, I appears to be gaining a lot of traction as the, the best uh, coherent definition. Um, Nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So the key elements of that definition is that a nature-based solution should address a societal challenge, such as flooding, drought, or clean water. And I do think that is importantly the first component to focus on. That is the essence of a nature-based solution. It is solving some societal challenge. Um, and some societal challenge not often associated with nature conservation per se. It's some other societal challenge, one that's often solved by infrastructure, which is in the title of our session. Uh, the second key part of that definition is that it uses ecosystems, protection, management, restoration to address that challenge. And third, that there will be these associated and simultaneous benefits of human well-being or biodiversity. Um, now, nature-based solutions encompass a broad range of, of, of interventions and actions, uh, and they include mitigation for climate and adaptation to climate, um, climate change. So just to clarify, we'll be focusing almost exclusively here on the adaptation side. Um, and, and you can see in the adaptation side, water-related interventions and water-related societal benefits are predominate. Uh, and just one thing to note, uh, I won't talk about it much, but just one thing to note that as we think about the global uh, uptake and expansion of nature-based solutions for adaptation, we should be thinking about the synergies with mitigation and vice versa. If we're going to be doing a bunch of forest restoration uh, for climate mitigation, car carbon sequestration, we should also be thinking about how those could have adaptation benefits in terms of you know where and, and, and how they're managed. Um, I'll show this image because one thing I, I'll touch on later is we really need to be thinking about nature-based solutions 
as something that we plan and manage within an overall system to the extent possible. So just showing a cartoony uh, conceptual image of a water of a river basin to think about uh, nature-based solutions. Um, and just real quick, what are the common nature-based solutions for water challenges? Uh, they could include, and, and here you'll see, I put the societal uh, need, the societal challenge first, and then the ecosystem in parentheses. And again, I want us to think about nature-based solutions first and foremost as a way of solving challenges and then doing it with ecosystems. So the challenge is flood risk. Uh, various aspects of floodplain management, wetlands can be helpful for flood risk. Um, stormwater or urban flooding, uh, urban wetlands and green infrastructure within cities uh, can be a solution. Uh, water quantity, how we manage forests uh, and how we manage floodplains, groundwater uh, infiltration, that can, that can be a way to help manage water quantity. Uh, water quality, managing forests and other ecosystems upstream of water supply reservoirs, um, but also wetlands in an agricultural landscape can be a, can be a very effective way at uh, reducing uh, fertilizer or other agricultural runoff into uh, natural water bodies. Coastal protection. Now we're mostly talking freshwater here. So coastal protection like mangroves and marshes, you may think that's not quite belonging here, but these are systems that often depend on the input of sediment uh, to build. So marshes and the value of marshes and mangroves is that they build, they build land that serves as a buffer to storms, storm surges. Well, what are they building land with? They're often building it with the sediments coming in from rivers. And again, this is where the system scale um, thought process comes into play. Now we've been working at WWF, we've been working on this conceptual model of how do we get to transformative change using nature-based solutions, both for mitigation and adaptation. So I'm not going to go into this the full detail, but just note that on the left, there are a set of barriers. And you will commonly see this in the reports about nature-based solutions. Uh, because when people talk about them, like I am today, it often seems like they make so much sense. Why aren't these, why aren't NBS? Uh, being implemented everywhere. So uh, th there, is a, there is a gap in funding, there is a gap in implementation. So people often focus on what are the reasons for that gap? What are the barriers? Socioeconomic, technological, institutional. Um, we need to overcome them with what's here in the middle with some long-term and short-term enablers that will get past those barriers so that we can actually scale up to transformative change over here on the right. Now, I'm going to raise a few of these barriers, but I'm not going to be able to get into them and talk about the solutions. And in fact, that's what I'm looking forward to this panel, that I think this panel is going to be talking about different aspects of these barriers and how the experience people have had overcoming those barriers. But one of the first barriers that I want to address, and I've already alluded to this, is there's a lot of confusion about what NBS are. And I think it can serve as a barrier um, because there's a risk of diluting the concept of nature-based solutions with just general environmental management or with general conservation. Um, and when people think that, uh, that people are just relabeling nature conservation as NBS, I think it dilutes the impact. It reduces the credibility. Nature-based solutions are different um, in the sense, and of course we've been doing versions of this, but this concept is something that we're trying to mobilize funding and to build into budgets and strategies. It is something distinct from, from nature conservation, from typical protection of ecosystems. And so the way I think of it is, you can go back to that definition, but there's a few questions that you should ask yourself. You know, am I looking at a nature-based solution? Well, one way to ask that is, one way to figure that out is to ask yourself, does this project accomplish someone else's objective? Let's say if you, so I work for a conservation organization. This question is actually <laughs> directed at me and my colleagues. So if we as a nature conservation organization are trying to promote nature-based solutions, we have to ask ourselves, does this project also accomplish someone else's objective enough that they would put their money behind it, whether that's public funding or private investment? Is, are you solving somebody else's problem and they believe that you're solving the problem to the point they would put their money behind it? You might be doing a wetland restoration and you might be able to say, yeah, it, it probably helps with flood reduction. 
But if, if that's not the purpose, if that isn't designed to be able to measurably sh show flood risk reduction, you're not going to have other people wanting to invest in it. And then that's called nature conservation. That's called floodplain restoration. If you're doing it in a way where you can show the benefits and they are accruing benefits or accruing to someone else, potentially somebody with with a budget, that is a way to, to actually have NBS that can scale up because you're tapping into other sources of funding. And then the second question, you're accomplishing someone else's objective like flood risk reduction, are you doing it with an ecosystem? So very basic, you know, to accomplish that objective. These are very basic questions, but if you can answer yes to both these questions, it probably is in the realm of nature-based solution. You're solving somebody's problem and you're using a natural ecosystem or process to do it. This picture is representative of that. This is a, a levee or a dike setback, a realignment along a river to open up uh, what was a choke point that was causing backwater flooding, to open it up and to reduce floods. Now, it's also a great restoration of one of the most productive and diverse habitats that we have, um, but it's also solving somebody else's problem, which means it can tap into other sources of funding and it can legitimately be considered within uh, flood risk management strategies. Now, if you're going to, as I just said, if you're going to be solving someone else's problem, you have the imperative of measuring that performance. You have to be able to demonstrate it. So this is showing uh, that levy setback on the Elbe River in Germany, and this project actually was tested with a major flood in 2013. What you can see here, and the kilometers are the kilometers um, from the beginning of the river, from where the river is mapped at the beginning. So we're moving from left to right, we're moving downstream. The red band here shows the full distance where the levees were set back to open up and give floodwaters room to spread out. Okay, that's this red band. Now, the red hydrograph shows the, the distance, um, the decrease in water level um, between what would have what would have happened if the project had not been there. And what you can see is that for this town, which is just upstream of the restoration area, the water level uh, against the levees in the 2013 flood was a half a meter lower. That's, a, that's a, actually a major improvement in reducing flood risk for those levees to have that much of a drop. So this project is able to show that it has measurable performance benefits uh, for flood risk reduction, somebody else's problem. Um, we've also been looking into this. This is a paper that I was part of, led by Mike Ackerman. Uh, we did a, a full uh, literature review of all these studies in Africa that looked at nature-based solutions. Um, we found about 21 studies that looked at the role of floodplains in flood risk. And we found that nearly every study showed that there was a decrease in flood levels uh, below floodplains. Strong support that floodplains are a feature that can reduce downstream flooding. So just to conclude, I want to get back to a few ideas here. Nature-based systems, nature-based solutions at scale and system thinking. We need, to, we need to take system thinking so we can get NBS up to uh, meaningful and large scales. So for example, what is system thinking? Well, I've already mentioned this, but mangroves are the almost the poster child for NBS, but, they're, but they are coastal. Uh, but we see mangroves are being mentioned all the time. They are the example of, of why NBS should be considered. And they protect coasts and they, they reduce storm surges, et cetera. But what do mangroves often need? In many systems, mangroves need sediment. They need to be trapping sediment, building it up, expanding it. That's how they play their buffering storm protection role. We need to think about the systems. So a free-flowing river that still has sediment to deliver is actually a critical part of a coastal nature-based a solution called mangroves. So we can think upstream, think about rivers. And now thinking about NBS implementation at scale, moving beyond small projects, which certainly can have their benefit, but to solving big problems, solving big problems for agencies like flood management agencies. So the city, and, and when I said NBS are not new, well, a hundred years ago, the city of Sacramento uh, was being flooded even though it had extensively invested in levees. 100 years ago, they decided to reconnect 60,000 hectares of floodplain. And now you can see, now we're shifting into the flood season, 90% of the floodwaters that go th through the Sacramento River go through this reconnected floodplain called the Yolo Bypass and the Sutter Bypass. Um, and they didn't intend this to be a nature conservation project. This was the best solution for solving flood risk. Um, 
but this is how a nature-based solution can be mainstreamed and main, uh, you know, put into uh, the budgets and programs of agencies. And when that happens, NBS will really get to scale if it can be demonstrated that it solves a problem. Well, this 60,000 hectare of floodplain solves a huge problem, which is it keeps Sacramento from the city of Sacramento, the capital of California, it keeps it from getting flooded. Now, I like to call this the, an accidental model of nature-based solutions, because again, they did this in the 1930s. They were not thinking about ecosystems at all. But along the way, this has become the most important floodplain habitat in the Central Valley. So for example, when native fish get out onto this floodplain, uh, they grow much bigger. These are juvenile Chinook salmon that were growing in the floodplain on the right versus the fish that were growing in the river. The floodplain is productive. Uh, it's warmer and more productive. You see huge benefits for, for native uh, fish and wildlife. This was not intended. That's why I call it an accidental model. But now it has been recognized. And now this system is being increasingly managed for its ecosystem benefits, even though it is also the centerpiece of the flood management system that protects the city of Sacramento. So just want to think about this. Getting NBS to scale is going to require overcoming these constraints and solving other people's problems. So now I'd like to turn it over to the panel. Thank you, Jeff, for an excellent presentation and, and uh, uh, very good starting point for the panel uh, discussion. Uh, we have a very nice panel here with uh, experts from various organizations. Uh, I will come back to that a little bit uh, later. Uh, uh, the panel will reflect on Jeff's keynote here and uh, which also included uh, bringing nature-based solutions into larger, sc larger scale and system scale. Uh, Jeff also talked about barriers and enablers or nature-based solutions as a very important point for the panel to discuss. And we hope also that the panel discussions and Jeff's keynote will increase the understanding of nature-based solutions uh, as, as a future development to, to address our problems related to climate change. I will just now introduce the panel uh, for you. We have uh, Sandhya Pukrayak from WWF in the panel. Uh, Sandhya Pukrayak is the NBS coordinator for the Living European Rivers Initiative for WWF. She has earlier also worked with similar issues in IUCN and uh, UNEP. Um, uh, then we have Margarita Caso. Uh, she is the general coordinator of adaption to climate change at the National Institute. Um, of ecology and climate change in Mexico. Uh, this is the research institute for the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. Then we also have uh, Eileen Burke. Uh, she is a global lead for water resources at the World Bank and uh, by having that important position to also work all over the world and various places. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Ellis Penning, um, she is the lead. Uh, she leads the, the Tata Strategic Research Program on nature-based solutions and carries out a variety of projects, both in the Netherlands and internationally. And then we have Anna San Lorente. Um, uh, she currently works at the li liaison office of IH. He delved as a project assistant, and in her free time, she also volunteers for what the Water Youth Network in their communications and social media team. So Anna will also be our um, young professional in the team, uh, which is very important uh, for the future. Okay, then I will ask um, uh, the panelists to reflect on 
on uh, Jeff's talk with uh, with their own background and also related to various organizations you come from and the roles you have there. So we can start with Sanja. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, of course, I have already prepared some, some uh, notes for, from today, but I have already, as I've listened to Jeff's talk, I had some also new, new, new ideas. Um, so so uh, uh, what, what, what we are thinking right now, where we are at this, as this point in time, uh, um, I think uh, we need to address the socioeconomic barriers and also traditional knowledge. And that's what Jeff was uh, mentioning before as the examples that have happened uh, a long, long time ago. So I think we need to really pay attention to that. Uh, but basically, what what I, what I wanted to say, uh, and my point is that that we really need to think about uh, uh, involving our societies. So, as we know, as Jeff has said, uh, 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 ecosystems are being overused. We have the decline of biodiversity and decline of ecosystem services on a global scale, and. Uh, and I think as we can see, our conservation approaches are no longer enough. That is why we want to involve more people. We want to involve business sectors. We want to have uh, various ministries in the countries that, that we can actually make this change happen. And that's what nature-based solutions are. We are not abandoning our conservation approaches. We are actually enhancing and upscaling uh, uh, our approaches. And through nature-based solutions, as Jeff has said already, we want to address societal challenges but we want to preserve the biodiversity at the same time. Uh, Jeff has already mentioned the IUCN definition, and I think that this it, it, it is at the moment a very comprehensive definition, and uh, uh, it has involved a lot of scientists uh, and a lot of people uh, to, to actually come up with that. But uh, the, the main difference between our traditional approaches and what we're doing now is what societal challenges we can solve. So Jeff has mentioned already the, the floods, the water quality, but uh, uh, my, my experience and what I can contribute to this uh, discussion is the, let's say some, some experience from the ground. And, uh, and that is mainly the first step when we want to apply the nature-based solutions and that is the stakeholder engagement. So first of all, when we want to implement a solution, we need to understand uh, what uh, people are facing with. That's why we need to involve either people on a national level, regional level, local level, and we want to understand what is their point of view. And then we can help them solve, uh, solve this in, in, in the best way and, uh, and also while preserving nature at the same time. So we start from the societal challenge but also we are preserving the biodiversity. So it, it can be done in a, in a different way. Usually it's consultations, it's awareness raising, and uh, we, we are trying to see the problems in the same way and see uh, what our society that we're dealing with is facing and how we can help them solve, solve this with nature-based solutions. And uh, I think once we gain this support and make it sustainable in the long term, then then uh, then I think uh, we we got the win-win situation. So so uh, um, it's um, uh, my let's say that uh, uh, my experience is mo mostly with societal issues and uh, and stakeholder engagement. And I would be happy to answer any questions. And I think I'm already running over time. Uh, from what I wanted to say, but uh, yes, education and stakeholder consultation and keeping the same the, the contact and early stakeholder engagement. I think it's very important. It's just one step of NBS besides besides what Jeff was saying already. You muted. You you are muted. Sorry, thank you, Sanja, for a very good uh, reflection. Uh, so we then we move fastly on to Margarita, which represents the government as well. So please, Margarita. Yes, and um, thank you very much for the for the invitation, and thank you, Jeff, 
for your presentation. I would like to start by uh, mentioning that while Mexico is a mega diverse country, which carries the, the great responsibility of preserving this biodiversity, it's also a very vulnerable country to the impacts of climate change, mainly due to its location between two oceans, its tropical latitude and its strong social economic inequalities. Um, we also have a pre-Hispanic legacy with a large amount of traditional knowledge um, that is essential to preserve. And the combination of these three facts in itself is, is a great challenge. Therefore, therefore, climate change adaptation is, is urgent and the, the options and approaches nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based adaptation offer are a priority for our country. Um, we have 182 natural protected areas that represent almost 11% of the country's territory. We're striving to increase this, this surface. We are also working to incorporate uh, NBS in territorial planning instruments. Uh, and as an example of this is the, the development of integrated management plans for, for watersheds that incorporate climate change scenarios. These, these plans focus on restoring ecosystems and, and promoting connectivity throughout the, the basin, throughout the watershed. Um, NBS and, and EBA uh, have an important place in Mexico's policy instruments related to, to climate change, such as the National Climate Change Strategy and the Special Program on Climate Change. These two instruments involve uh, actions and, and goals of basically uh, all the ministries of the federal government, which is important for mainstreaming adaptation. And uh, NBS have, have also a prominent place in our NDCs in both the mitigation and adaptation components. We found that an important challenge is to always ma maintain a systemic approach, which uh, Jeff already, already mentioned, uh, a social ecosystem approach, we often call it. And, and to avoid a misconception of nature-based solutions and that can lead to negative effects on biodiversity, ensuring that mitigation and adaptation actions do not have uh, uh, adverse effects on the conservation and restoration of biodiversity. The, the binomial constituted by, by the conservation of biodiversity and adaptation to climate change is at the center of the discussion of the UNFCCC. And in this forum, Mexico has highlighted the, the, the importance of the coherence and if possible synergy between different international conventions, such as the UNFCCC and the CBD, since the, the actions derived from these conventions are implemented in the same territory. Finally, I want to mention that COVID-19 pandemic, um, that the COVID-19 pandemic has, has shown us how, how very vulnerable we all are to an unexpected event. Climate change will surely bring many unexpected events and we have to learn to, to deal, to cope with this, with, with the uncertainty. Uh, this is why NBS and EBA approaches have to be our bet to, to face this uncertainty and, and to cope with, with the effects of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, very good to get the country perspective of uh, Mexico as well. And then we move back to the global scale again. And, um, Eileen from the World Bank, can you <laughs> please give your reflections? Thanks, Leif, and thanks to Jeff for that great talk. Um, he, Jeff mentioned that we see this sort of proliferation of publications on nature-based solutions, and the World Bank has, like everyone else, has, has um, added to that list. There was a flagship publication called Integrated integrating green and gray that we came out with a couple of years ago. And our urban group is about to come out with a new catalog of integrated urban flood management um, case studies as well. Um, but we're still left with this situation, this, this conundrum that Jeff brought up, which is how do we take nature-based solutions to scale? Um, and that's part of what we're looking at in a new study that we're working on right now on water storage. We're recognizing the importance of integrated water storage to assuring water security um, and recognizing even in, in basins where we're expected to have increased mean rainfall with climate change, um, the amount of water storage uh, that will be needed to assure the same levels of reliability is increasing. 
Um, El Tahir out of MIT has documented this in the Nile and there are others as well. Um, and so it's, we, we're going to need more water storage and part of, part of meeting the storage gap that GWP and EMI and others have identified is working through nature-based solutions. Um, we often rely on nature-based solutions currently for water storage and water provisioning, even though we don't um, recognize them as that. Most of our, our water storage is in natural solutions, um, be it aquifers or, or glaciers or lakes or, or in-stream in -stream water storage. And so I think a first step is really recognizing that how much provisioning those services provide and beginning to protect them, beginning to protect aquifers, both in terms of water quality and, and water quantity. So I think maybe that's the next step that Jeff was talking about moving beyond conservation um, in looking at who's interested in protecting those sources because we're currently relying on them. So anyway, we're undertaking a study now on water storage, looking at how we can move forward with this integrated approach in, in protecting and in providing more water storage through um, both green and gray um, uh, methods. Um, we'll be talking about this more on Friday. There's a session at 7 a.m. DC time. Um, so everyone's invited to that. Um, there was also the question that Jeff asked about who, who's willing to pay, who's willing to step up and pay. And I think everybody that's interested in the IU, in the, the nature-based solution space recognizes that the, the increased role that a lot of water utilities are playing in this space. They have a vested interest in ensuring that the water that is that they have the adequate quality and quantity of water coming to them, and they're one one client that's interested in protecting the upstream watershed, in in paying for nature-based solutions. Um, and we have a session on that in a few hours this afternoon that the World Bank is is sponsoring as well. That everyone's invited to, um, to to look at at specifically how we can do this in the in the utility space. Um, I could go on a lot more, um, but I'll yield to, to my other colleagues who have of uh, interesting examples as well. Thank you, uh, Eileen, to be short and sharp. Uh, very good. Um, then we move on to Ellis, which will also bring more of the research uh, part of, of nature-based solutions. So please, uh, please, Alice. Yeah, thank you very much, Leif. And also thanks to Jeff for his excellent talk and introduction to the topic. And I can only fully agree with Jeff in that we have to take this from a large landscape or catchment scale approach because there are so many parts of ecosystem functions that are intertwined throughout from upstream to downstream towards the coast. And of course, that system understanding is one of the main topics that you need to have a good understanding about. Now, Jeff has been talking that from the perspective of, the, of, of say the spatial scale, but I'd also like to add to that the temporal skill, because we do know that nature-based solutions are dynamic over time and that obviously they will develop. And with that development, also their function might change. So having a good understanding of that does make that you can uh, also design with that understanding in mind to understand that forests will develop over time makes that you also might have to maintain them or monitor them to see how they are uh, developing over time. So these new ways of monitoring are enablers. I, I prefer not to talk too much about the barriers, but rather about the enablers of actually getting nature-based solutions going. And this monitoring and adaptive management over time can help you to say, if we, in the design of a nature-based solution, think about this adaptive monitoring and maintenance. And we give it a place in its overall life cycle functioning. And we also do this together with the stakeholders in the field. We can come up with solutions that are more acceptable and they're also more trustworthy over time because we know where to interfere if needed. For example, with the sand engine, that is a big coastal sand nourishment, we see that we are managing that also by the monitoring of it and understanding how it is developing. Now, if we're talking about that part, obviously in the field, we hope not to see the extreme events for which perhaps a nature-based solution is also designed. So extreme events that you would say would happen once every thousand years perhaps, or, uh, and that the nature-based solution should also be helping for, for example, vegetated foreshores in front of bike si or levee systems. If you want to see if, you, if you're modeling that in a correct way, because obviously often in designs, numerical modelings are being used, it might pay off 
to see if we can invest in more experimental efforts to replicate the results of such an event in, for example, large scale film experiments. So from that perspective, uh, I'd leave it with that because that's my three minutes, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, uh, very interesting as well as the other presentations. And then finally, we will give the uh, floor to, to Anna uh, to give her reflections. Please, Anna. Thank you, uh, Life and Jeff, for the presentation. And also thank you for all panelists to bring such great insights on nature-based uh, nature solutions for this conversation. We all know that there are many different types of nature-based solutions uh, worldwide, from sustainable energy to coastal environments. And in my keynote, I'll be focusing more on the latter. Despite of projects being so different, um, as Jeff previously mentioned in this presentation, they all share different challenges and constraints from economical aspects to social and cultural. One big challenge that uh, coastal NBS face is invisibility as marine environments are often overlooked and their importance to human life is underestimated. Only uh, communities that have direct contact or their livelihoods really depend on them. They are highly aware of the climate change impacts on these environments and also in their lives. One way of protecting these environments and mitigate and adapt to climate change um, are of course NBS solutions. And as uh, Jeff uh, greatly ex explained in his presentation, one of them would be uh, mangrove restoration. Another example for a coastal NBS project would be coral reef restoration and bringing back in mind the system thinking um, uh, mindset. Uh, what I want to explain with this example is the difference between an engineered solution and the NBS one. An engineered solution for coastal um, for reef uh, projects would be to sink some microcyllables that do allow photosynthesis and allow planktonic life to regenerate uh, in degraded areas, having a positive regulatory effect to wave erosion, but it does not promote any biodiversity around them and does uh, um, not provide other benefits to society. Differently, NBS um, solution being coral reef restoration uh, makes a teaming of reefs and not only provides a habitat, but spawning a nursery ground for economically important fish species, leading to provide jobs for communities, recreation and tourism, as well as a vital source of medicine and cultural value. Um, I want to finalize with my keynote by saying that we need to continue with pushing for NDS solutions to overcome these, um, I hope, temporary challenges and that with time people will see more value in them and to also continue shining, shining light in these environments that they are uh, less visible for the human eye, such as the marine ones. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, uh, for a very nice talk as well. Uh, very important to hear from you as well, because you are the future uh, uh, in relation to this as a young professional. So uh, we can stop uh, the panel discussion there. I think we have used our 20 minutes of time and then we can, we can move over to the Q&A. Uh, have Eloy or um uh harm or both of you have you chosen uh, some of the questions from the audience yet yes uh, thank you live we have uh, received uh, several questions in the chat thank you very much for that thank you the panel members for uh, your contribution uh, i'll try to and read some of the questions, but as uh, Harm mentioned in the beginning, we have now about 15 minutes for this Q&A. If there are some questions that are not uh, responded, uh, answered in this session, please, uh, I'm going to share my email and we can follow up this session afterwards. So, so there's going to be an option to, to answer to the other questions afterwards. So I will start uh, with the question from uh, Wesley Pereira. Uh, are there any regulatory frameworks to stop environmental degradation and changes to land use plans of coastal wetlands, including age old mangrove and salt marshes for implementing nature based solution for climate resilience? Yeah, 
Yeah, may, maybe uh, Jeff, you can start to 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 uh, um, answer that. Working with the regulator or working with these nature-based solutions uh, in different parts, uh, and then maybe we can follow up if this uh, there is a regulatory framework in 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 Mexico uh, since we have a one one person, uh, Margarita from the government there, Jeff. Sure, uh, definitely. I'm not an expert in regulatory uh, structures. Um, I can speak a little bit about the United States, where mangroves and and salt marshes, for example, would fall under the definition of wetlands. I would think coastal wetlands, uh, and they would be protected under um, laws such as the Clean Water Act. They would uh, there would be various protections to prevent. Uh, conversion or would require permits for any conversion and the permits would then probably trigger some mitigation or avoidance. Um, but certainly that can be part of a driver for nature-based uh, nature solutions, um, including in some places uh, you can have mitigation banks where um, because of other developments on wetlands, uh, there's a requirement to pay into a mitigation bank and then that can be used to, to fund uh, restoration uh, that could be part of, of a nature-based solution. But I'd be very curious to hear about the people who are actually experts in coastal systems about how they have used or what the regulatory structures might be that, that could be used to promote uh, greater uptake of NBS. Would anybody else uh, uh, also like to answer this? Uh, I would maybe have some, uh, some uh, comments on this. Well, I don't have the inside knowledge in, 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 in every country uh, and how it all goes. I think the, that we still have a lot of uh, regulatory options and uh, we do have already a lot of policies that, can, uh, that we can use in applying nature-based solutions. Maybe they don't mention them as nature-based solutions as such. Maybe they mention uh, ecosystem services protection or enhancement or healthy ecosystems. Uh, but the one that I would just like to, to uh, 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 really mention, of course, by, besides the Green Deal, which is relevant for Europe, I would like to mention the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Sendai framework uh, is not very well known in the nature conservation community, but it does mention uh, 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 healthy ecosystems in, some, in terms of preventing disasters. And it does deal with both the freshwater ecosystems and the coastal ecosystems. So I think we already do have a very good background in the different policies in our countries. It depends, of course, uh, uh, in which country we're coming from, but uh, we can always find that little piece of, uh, of uh, let's say, legislation or policy that we can rely upon. Thank you, Sanja. Uh, Margarita there probably would like to hear if there is a framework in place uh, for oh. well, the there's a there's a great um, ban in, in Mexico for, for any mangrove uh, alteration. Uh, these are, are highly protected ecosystems and very recognized uh, for their important environmental services, particularly for climate change um, due to, to, to the, the high carbon sequestration, the stabilization of coast, the protection um, to, to hydrometeorological events, uh, the, the uh, pollutants filter. These are very, very uh, protected um, ecosystems uh, in, in Mexico, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Or we can move to another questions from the audience. Okay, Eloy, uh, maybe you can provide another question from the audience. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll go for the, the next one. Uh, this uh, might go to uh, Jeff. Uh, does this definition, I think it's referring to the, the one, uh, the first slide you had uh, with the definition of NBS, uh, Jeff, does this definition also require deliberate and proactive inclusion of activities around ecosystem functions, services? Well, I think I would say the definition uh, on its face would suggest that nature-based solutions provide net benefits for 
biodiversity. Um, I think that, so I consider that part of the definition of nature-based solutions in that they, they do provide uh, benefits. Uh, I think that there's probably room for, for debate about um, how, how strong that has to be. I mean, some people would argue that um, there are projects that you could do in cities where it might be much better overall to be, to be using natural systems like grassy swales or, or uh, gardens on rooftops, and that these would not have you know, biodiversity benefits uh, that are uh, traditional or for you know, um, endangered species or, or large ecosystems, uh, but they would be having social benefits um, and there would be, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I, I, I don't think that we should get too hung up on requiring nature-based solutions to be also excellent conservation projects. I think where that happens, where there is a synergy, synergy, I think that is good. But when I think about the world of flood management and I think about managing floods by levees and dams, and those can be important and those have their roles in, in protecting property in, in some places, of course. Um, but if we're thinking about going forward, those are types of interventions that have major negative impacts on rivers. If there was a nature-based solution approach um, even if it didn't have great proactive biodiversity benefits, I would rather see that kind of balanced approach uh, rather than typical engineering where it works. So, I, you know, I'm not sure if that is clear, but my bottom line is, yes, I think that there should be benefits that should be part of the definition, part of the aspiration. I don't think we should get so hung up on requiring nature-based uh, solution projects to always be uh, top performers for, for conservation, but where they can be, that, that would be great. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for, for that statement. I think, Eloy, now I will just direct uh, one question to Alice, and one question to Eileen, one question to Alice, and one question to Anna, so that they also get some final statements. Uh, so the first one is to Eileen. Uh, with, and you touched a little bit about this funding. Uh, with regard to funding of um, uh, nature-based solutions initiatives projects, could you el elaborate a little bit more about possible enablers of this in a quite a short statement because we have like in total seven minutes um, Eileen, are you here? Oh, sorry for that. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Thanks. I'll be quick. And Jeff teed this up well in, in defining nature-based solutions by saying to finance nature-based solutions, um, you have to have somebody who's willing to pay for these services. And the traditional sort of examples of payment for environmental services, for upstream watershed management, et cetera, yield lessons. But there's a study that the bank recently published that I think is a really helpful guide in this manner. Um, and it's called um, Valuing the Benefit of Nature-Based Solutions um, in Urban Integrated Urban Flood Management. And it was done by Marcus Wishart and some of the team in China. And it looks at and builds off of the valuing water work that Australia and others did to look at integrated urban flood management and to define the different services that are provided and the problems that are solved and then and to identify who might be willing to, to pay for those in terms of tariffs and taxes and transfers and other forms of payment and really outline sort of a nice multi-tiered process that, that you can go through in looking at different nature-based solutions and figuring out who might like to pay. So that right now is my go-to go -to guide for, for answering that question. Super, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, then we, we go over to Alice. Uh, you talked about this, um, uh, you mentioned not only spatial scale or this system scale, you also mentioned uh, scale over time uh, as an important aspect there because of the natural dynamics. Uh, related to both these scales, how can we quantify the effect of effects of implementing these nature-based solutions uh, now, now and in the future 
given that we are getting more and more advanced, uh, what we call it, models, methods as well? Yeah, well, it, it's an interesting question because I do think that we that our evidence base about nature-based solutions is growing by the minute. Also, seeing all the reports that are currently coming out that are showing new examples of nature-based solutions. So it is it is a combination of both uh, being aware of the fact that there are tools available to quantify parts of how a nature-based solution functions and being aware of the fact that there are examples from which we can learn as well. But it's also about how we can link these together to also say how can we prove that in a new situation it's going to work as well. So it's this link between the evidence base and the modeling and also the developing in developments in that to work together to, uh, to show people that there are good criteria that you can use. Thank you for a uh, crisp answer, uh, uh, Alice. Uh, we will take this uh, uh, along with us. Uh, then finally, Anna, uh, last question for for you as well. Uh, since you work with the acquisition of projects uh, uh, and these nature-based solutions projects, what trends are you seeing in the market? Uh, is it becoming more and more increasingly projects that are coming up to the scene uh, in the market? Yes, yeah, so from my current job position, um, as you explained, I am dealing with acquisition of projects for IET Delft. And I do see an increasing trend of becoming more popular of these projects uh, being advertised for uh, from institutions such as the World Bank, for instance, or the Asian Development Bank, and among others. Um, uh, however, I do think that from uh, speaking more from like a private point of view, what is more a challenge and probably is more share among other environmental consultancies is to convince um, clients that uh, it is uh, a viable solution. Since we are talking that from our mindset that it is centralized in nature to theirs that could be more economical. So I do think that over time, as more uh, evidence is collected, as Nas Ellis has explained, it is growing and more uh, journals and um, publications are coming out, this sort of uh, mindset will inevitably change. Thank you, Anna, for that late last statement. Um, we have uh, two minutes uh, left of the Q&A, Eloy. Uh, should we round it up or... Yes, I think we can uh, try to use these two minutes to, to try to answer the, the last question, but uh, keep in mind that we have two minutes. There is a very interesting question um, here uh, talking about, uh, let's see, I'll find it. Yes, it's talking about uh, this win-win uh, when we speak about NBS, not always we speak with this win-win situation, but uh, here, uh, this mentioning that win-win-lose uh, is very much the missing dimension of NBS. That's one of the reasons why there are real disconnects between climate adaptation and the water community. So uh, he's asking if there are trade-offs, uh, win-win-lose, for example, tree planting. Uh, does that mean that by definition is not an NBS? I think the answer to that one will be quite lengthy. Uh, so, but is there anybody who will make, want to make a short statement, very short statement on that? Okay, I, I, can, I can do that, but I see also Eileen wants yeah, to say something. Both of you are very short then, so. Yeah, okay, I will, I will just say that uh, 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 in, uh, in uh, answer to the very long question, uh, there is a process of how we approach NBS and it really, uh, uh, then it can really show us how, how to go forward. And it's very easy to follow. And uh, uh, it's uh, based on ICN guidelines. Uh, it's uh, called the self-assessment tool. And it's very easy to then understand what is NBS and what is not. And uh, I could give a very long answer to this, but as I'm aware of time and I want to give Eileen some time, so I'm gonna stop here. 
Good. Uh, thank you, Eileen. <laughs> Bring up the example of Los Plateau, and I think yes, absolutely. In watershed management, there can be a win-win-lose, right? You see some subcatchments where um, dry season water flows downstream of, of reforestation in some areas are lower, um, and that's in some ways because the upstream tree planting has not taken into effect um, the water use. We joke about needing to put the water back in watershed management in some areas. And this is why, as Ellis was talking about, the monitoring, the publishing, the studying of these nature-based solutions is so important so that we understand that we are accounting for um, any possible changes in the landscape and the ecosystem um, and, and um, adapting for and, and, um, and working with those, those changes as possible to make sure that everyone's winning in the end. Thank you again, uh, Eileen. And then I think we we round up this uh, panel discussion with the associated questions and answers. And then there will be some wrapping up here with some key takeaways and way forward. Uh, so um, we can probably start with Jeff. Great. Uh, I, there's a lot that I would want to say to wrap up. I think it's because in some ways I feel like we were just beginning to scratch the surface. Uh, uh, actually, I mean, I think the speakers, the panelists were bringing up really interesting um, perspectives um, and their experiences, but the questions were pushing us uh, in directions that show that there's a lot more discussion, and you know this is a, this is a really a, a lot to think about, a lot to plan. I mean, these questions about trade-offs. Um, we could only begin to be, begin to talk about trade-offs. Um, you know, I talked about at the beginning. There's climate change mitigation and adaptation, and I mentioned synergies. Well, I mentioned synergies, but I didn't mention trade-offs. So, uh, that, you know, that's the other side of the coin, and, and that's really important. Um, we began to talk about how how much benefit is necessary and um you know I, I gave the answer that i that i gave but that's a really important question about nbs um and it also relates to trade-offs uh and i think that um but i think it was uh sanja who really emphasized stakeholder engagement and i think that um you know that's a if if projects are grounded not just in the science but grounded in that kind of dialogue it can help surface trade-offs and, 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 avoid, and avoid conflicts as much as possible in, in design and implementation. Okay, good, very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, for being that short uh, harm. Yeah, I think uh, great discussions and I think also valuable input uh, for developing pathways to, uh, to climate resilient uh, future. I think also the uh, latest IPCC report was very clear. Uh, climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying. And that also means that we urgently need to adapt to changing climate and build resilience. And therefore large scale transitions are needed. And of course there will, and there will be ecosystem based approaches and nature based solutions will be important, important there as well. Uh, also, the European Green Deal is reflecting on that uh, from the European Commission. So, but we need to act now um, to be ready for the future as implementation also of large scale measures takes a lot of time. For example, uh, the Dutch Room for the River approach that started in the mid 90s is still ongoing. Um, so my take home message is, is that we have to know those ecosystem based approaches and nature based solutions. Although there are still many questions, we need uh, to act now. So we need also therefore an adaptive approach, um, starting with uh, the implementation of nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches. Thank you, Harm, uh, as well. And I, you have all, Jeff and Harm, you have touched about everything I thought about. So I think I'll just say I agree with you both. So. Uh, with the same takeaways. So then Eloy, I can give you the handover to have the closing of the session. Uh, thank you, Life. Uh, yes, that was a uh, good timing. Uh, we have uh, yeah, just one, uh, two minutes left. I would like to use uh, this uh, time to thank you all for being here. Thank you, the panel members for accepting our invitation in this uh, session. It has been a pleasure, a pleasure uh, having you here. 
thank you as well to um, Jeff and uh, Harm and Life to make uh, this uh, session possible and uh, your contribution. And uh, thank you all the, the, the audience that are being interested. I've seen that it has been up to 100 at some point in this uh, session. So thank you very much for your interest. And as I said, uh, the questions that has not been answered, I will share my email and you can just uh, write it, write them to me. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Great.